think we can get started now. So welcome to the session. Um, I'm Sören, um, and I'm a software engineer on the Katana data science platform. Uh, interactive computing is, is something I'm very excited about, so I really hope I can share some of this excitement with you today. So let's get started. Learning is a fundamental part of our daily work as software developers. Problem solving is essentially learning, right? So we need to understand the problem and then learn about the right approach, how to solve it. And then the technology we're using is con constantly evolving, languages, libraries, tools. And we want to keep up, so we learn. But how do we learn? Turns out that often we can look at learning as a three-phase process. We usually start with observing things, and then we try to replicate um, the, the, the things we've observed, like um, trying, um, trying some example code ourselves. And finally, we start exploring, start changing things, and, and try something new. And um, that exploration phase is essentially uh, an interactive feedback loop. So in that loop, we start with trying, trying something new. Um, and then we observe the feedback we get from the world. And um, based on that feedback, we update our internal model um, so we learn. And then we try the next thing, um, observe new feedback, uh, and so on. And um, this feedback is, is very important because this is essentially what enables us to learn. And um, we really want it to be fast um, in some situations, um, because it's essential to our survival. Um, no one was harmed, no worries. But more generally, because only with fast feedback, we get a truly interactive uh, feedback loop, and that gives us a much better learning experience. So what about exploring code or data? Um, one approach for, for creating this, this fast feedback loop is uh, interactive computing. So interactive computing basically means we have a system which lets us um, write a block of code, immediately returns, uh, immediately runs that code, and prints back the result. And we can do that in a loop, giving us this, this fast feedback cycle. And if you think about it, that definition essentially describes a REPL. So how many of you use a REPL at least from time to time? OK, the, so that's almost 100% or almost everyone. Cool. Um, so yeah, the REPL lets us enter an expression, evaluates it immediately, and prints the result value. And so we can do this in a loop and continuously refine things, uh, or we can use previous results. And we don't have to explicitly print things, because the REPL does it for us automatically. And this is really great for, for exploring the language or, or, or trying out things because, yeah, because we have this fast feedback loop. Um, but the REPL, the Scala 2 REPL, also has a few pain points. Um, there's um, no support for, for, for editing multi-line expressions. Um, there's no, no pretty printing and limited syntax highlighting and auto-completion. And most importantly, there's no native support for, for loading Maven dependencies, uh, for solving dependencies, and that makes it much harder to explore and learn new libraries, right? Um, fortunately, there's another REPL implementation um, from Howie, Ammonite. So how many of you use Ammonite, at least from time to time? OK, I'd say still 50% or so. That's cool. Um, so, Ammonite addresses many of the of the issues that uh, of the default REPL. It has nicer, nicer formatting and and, and syntax highlighting, um, um, proper multi-line ex, uh, expression editing. Um, but more, most importantly, it has um, support for dynamic uh, dependency resolution um, with this um, import dollar IV syntax. So we can basically um, import any JVM library and use it immediately in, in, the same, um, in the same REPL session, which is really cool for 
yeah, exploring new libraries and trying uh, and, and, and learning new libraries, trying out new, new things. Regardless of whether we use the default REPL or Ammonite, though, um, there are some limitations that are that are inherent to the to the REPL design, and um, this is mostly because uh, the REPL is optimized for for exploration from scratch for for writing writing some code and seeing results fast. Um, it's but getting code out again is is harder. Reading, copying code um, is is not not as easy, and that's because we have these interleaved inputs and outputs, and um, all these refinement attempts in in our history, and also changing an older expression can be a, a bit hard. We we have to find it, and if we have dependent expressions, um, we have to find them all and um, uh, run them too, run by one, and that can quickly become tedious. Uh, sharing is also difficult because we don't don't really have a persistent document, or only the, the history file. So because of this this focus on exploration, um, the observe and the replicate phases are are not part of the REPL design. Um, but from a learning perspective, we rarely just start exploring. Um, we usually need some input first. So what often happens is that we have something like like here on the screenshot. So we have um, we have a browser window with some some tutorial for the observe phase, and then we have a REPL window um, where we have to copy the code over for for the replicate phase, and this just adds some overhead. So can we do better? Let's look at a, a cousin of the REPL worksheets. So Worksheets are quite similar to the REPL, but we have this full editor window where we can write expressions. And uh, when we hit run or save the worksheet, uh, the expressions will be evaluate, uh, evaluated and, um, and the results are shown on the, on the right-hand side. And um, yeah, because we have this editor window, um, without the, the interleaved inputs and outputs, um, reading, copying, and, and changing code um, is much easier. And changing is also easier because um, because when we hit run, all the expressions are evaluated in one go. So in contrast to the REPL, we don't have to, to manually track dependent expressions. Um, the drawback is that we lose control over, uh, uh, over when to execute which expression. And therefore, worksheets aren't, aren't very well suited for, for longer running computations like, like loading large data sets. Um, so what's also nice about them is the nice IDE integration, especially in, in, in uh, the Dotty worksheets like, like we see here. And, um, and that they are actually backed by files, so we can save them, put them in version control, and, and share them. And then we also have these online worksheets with, uh, which make sharing even easier. So of course, they don't have the nice IDE integration. Um, but um, yeah, sharing is really nice. We can just create a link and send it to someone, and um, they don't have to, to. They don't need any local setup. So we have um, we have uh, SCSD for JVM Scala and um, Scala Fiddle for Scala JS. Um, so looking at uh, worksheets from a learning perspective, um, what's different compared to the REPL? Well, replication works a bit better. Um, because we could provide worksheets pre-filled with examples, and copy and paste is also a bit easier. Um, but it's still not an, a very integrated experience. We, we still have these, these separate things, right? So looking again at this, this Scala tour example, um, we already have an, an example code, code snippet in here, right? So what if this ju wasn't just just static? Um, what if we actually could run this thing? And turns out we can. So if I hit Control Enter here, um, this will be evaluated uh, right in my slides, and we get our double salary, which is really nice. Um, but we can also um, edit this thing. So we have a real editor here. Um, so double salary is nice, but what about more? So 
So let's give us a triple salary. And now we can run this thing again. And here we go, more money. So how does this work? Um, turns out we're actually in a Jupyter notebook here. Uh, it's just shown as a slideshow um, using a plugin called Rise. And usually it looks much, uh, it looks more like, more like this, which is the, the classic uh, Jupyter interface, uh, which lets us interact with, with these, these notebooks. Um, but but what, what are these notebooks? Notebooks are interactive web-based documents. So they're web-based, they run in the browser, they're interactive, we can, we can edit things and, and, and run code. And we have, um, they're made of cells. We have two types of cells. Uh, one is documentation and one is code. So um, documentation cells are just, just markdown. We, we have all the usual markdown formatting options. Uh, we can include images, code fences, um, LaTeX equations. Um, but the cool thing is that we can um, edit them right in the browser. So if I double click on this, this uh, will change to, to an editor window. And I can write something here. And um, when I hit Control Enter again, um, this will be the updated. Um, we get the updated rendered view. And then we have code cells. We've already already seen one. So they're basically editors that let us write write code similar to to a worksheet. And we can of course evaluate that. So let's try this again. And oops we get a compile error, so we get all these uh, error messages uh, if something, something is wrong. Uh, so let's just fix that and run it again, and here we go. Um, but we aren't restricted to single, single cells. We can uh, have any number of cells in the notebook, and we can freely um, um, mix code cells with documentation cells. So here we have one doc doc cell uh, followed by, by two code cells, and of course we can evaluate them. And with the plugin we can even put these things side by side, so this is quite nice. Um, so instead of having these two separate things, documentation and, and, and code, um, we now have an integrated uh, document containing both and that's really nice for, for teaching and interactive learning. Um, yeah, because we, have, we, we now have integrated all these, these learning phases in one. Um, but notebooks are more. So they also integrate uh, worksheets uh, with REPLs. And uh, how this works is best seen in a little demo. So let's switch to another notebook. So, if we look at a single code cell, um, it behaves mostly like a worksheet. So we have multiple expressions, we have this editor window, and um, we can evaluate this thing. Oh, we should be able to evaluate this thing. Let's give it another try. And here we go. Um, and like in worksheets, when, when we hit run, um, it always uh, evaluates all, all cells in one go. So we, we don't have to track uh, dependent expressions manually. It's also persistent. Um, but it, it also saves the outputs. So this is really cool for, for sharing or putting these things online uh, or exporting them into, into a PDF or something like that. Um, on the other hand, they are a little bit um, limited um, when it comes to, to IDE features, so there's not the nice IDE integration. And um, also the outputs are shown below the cell by default, not on the right-hand side. 
but it shouldn't be too easy to actually change uh, the front end to, to have this side-by-side this -side view in, in notebooks too. Um, so if we look at code cells of a notebook as a whole, mm, they behave more like a REPL. And that's because we, we can run all these cells independently, um, which gives us better control when to run specific code. And also, previous uh, results are cached in memory. So if we have this, this um, huge data set here, which takes a long time to load, uh, if we uh, would run this in, the, in a worksheet, and um, if we wanted to change something here, we'd have to run the whole thing again, which uh, takes, takes some time, right? Um, in a notebook, we can just split these cells and um, run them independently. So we can load that data, and then it's cached in memory, and we can uh, use it in our computations and uh, change things, and it's much faster. But notebooks also give us um, even more uh, flexibility for, for prototyping. We can, we can select multiple cells and um, run them in one go, or we can run all cells, um, or we can move cells around. So we have this uh, drag and drop support here, uh, co copy and paste uh, even between different notebooks, uh, split and merge, and all these convenience features um, that make um, that, that make this is a good thing for, for prototyping. So, what about exploring data? With something REPL-like, like, like, like Spark Shell here, of course we can do that. Um, but because this is a terminal and it's text-based, it's usually not, not the best option to show data or visualize things. So what often happens is that we have these, these separate things. So we, we render, uh, we use some external graphics system to render our, our, our visualizations um, and have them in a, in a separate window. And yeah, so this is again not, not the, the best, the most integrated experience. And with notebooks on the other hand, um, we can do we can do a little bit better. So let's stay with this um, this very same example we just had on the screenshot, the Titanic data set, and run this. And now we have a nice um, HTML representation of of our data, a nice table, and we can even sort things. And um, so I I'd argue this this is uh, much better to read. Um, and the same for visualization. So we um, also have an integration for this for the Vegas library here and notebooks, and we can just run it. And here we go. We have our our plot um, uh, in, in the embedded in the notebook with our code, and we can share these things together. Um, and we aren't even restricted to, to static images because we have a browser, we have JavaScript available. Um, when we use the, the Plotly library, we um, can create these, these interactive, um, oops, these interactive um, plots where you can zoom in and uh, yeah, basically interact with the plot. And um, we are also not restricted to data. We can also visualize code, which is um, great for, for, for teaching, for instance. So here we use the, the, the RefTree library, which lets us uh, visualize data structures. Um, and we create a simple, a simple case class here and a, a list of people. And then we use RefTree to, to render, render this list. So let's give it a try. And here we go. So we have um, this nice structure showing uh, how, uh, how how the list, how the elements of the list are connected. Um, 
this, this, I think this is a really cool example for, for actually explaining these things. We can, we can even change things and run, run this again and get the, the updated value just within the notebook. Um, so, like with this learning example, um, um, we have, with the REPL, we have this, this, these separate views. Um, but in notebook, we have, uh, we have our output and the, and the source code integrated. So we have our output embedded with the code that produces it. So it stays in the same context. And I think this is a really cool, cool feature. So what I want to do next is look a little bit uh, at the technologies behind this. So um, the, the examples here, they were all run in a Jupyter notebook. And Jupyter is a, is a huge project uh, devoted to develop open source software, open standards, and services for, for interactive computing. And um, the flagship is this, this the Jupyter Notebook, the flagship software, but there's also a huge ecosystem around this. Um, and it's not restricted to, to a single programming language. So we have, um, we have support for um, Python and R, um, C Sharp and, uh, and Java, but also functional languages like F Sharp, Haskell, and of course, um, of course, Scala. Um, so Jupyter came out of the IPython shell. Um, IPython is yeah, basically an advanced interactive Python shell uh, similar to, to what we have with Ammonite for Scala. And um, in 2011, um, the IPython creators um, released the 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 IPython notebook interface, which is yeah, still pretty similar to what we, what we have today. So we have this, this documentation and runnable code and uh, also rich output integrated in, in, in this uh, notebook document. Um, but then they realized that this is actually something language agnostic. Um, so with Project Jupyter, they um, added support for, for other languages, basically moving the, the language agnostic part out of, of IPython. And um, initially, they supported um, Julia, uh, Python, and R, Jupyter. And in 2018, um, they released uh, JupyterLab, so last year, um, which is yeah, basically the next generation user interface for notebooks and, and more. So let's have a brief look at, at, the, uh, at the components of the, the Jupyter stack. So we have the, the user interface, the notebook interface, uh, which runs in the browser, um, and lets users interact with, with notebooks. And then we have the notebook server, which um, basically sets everything up, the communication, and delivers the, the UI, and also manages the, the notebook files. And um, we also have the kernel, uh, which is responsible for actually running, running our code and returning results. Uh, and they are connected through the Jupyter protocol, um, which gives us this loosely coupled architecture um, um, and that, that enables to, to basically develop these components independently and, and also scale and distribute things. So there are um, a bunch of uh, um, different frontends available. So we have the, the classic notebook and Jupyter Lab as its uh, designated successor. Uh, there's also Interact from the Netflix folks um, and um, a, a plugin for, for the Atom editor called Hydrogen, which is a little bit more worksheet-like, but with a Jupyter, with a Jupyter backend. And then uh, the, the major IDEs also have some limited um, notebook support, but currently it's um, restricted to Python. Um, but I've been hearing some rumors here that um, there are some ideas to, 
to actually improve the Scala story here. Yeah, and then, then we have kernels, and they are responsible for, for running, running the code or, um, or also compiling or talking to the compiler for compiled languages. Uh, they don't know anything about notebooks, so they just get a bunch of code and, um, and uh, run that code and, and return results or error messages. And in principle, they can be implemented in any language uh, as long as they support the, the Jupyter protocol. And, and nowadays, there are around 100 different kernels available for, for all kinds of languages. So all these examples we've seen so far, they um, were executed on the Almond kernel. Um, there's actually a bunch of, of kernels available, of Jupyter kernels available for Scala. Um, and most of them are based on the, on the default REPL. Ammonite, on the other hand, is, is built on top of Ammonite. And we've seen that Ammonite gives us um, all these nice convenience features. Um, and in, in Almond, we inherit, mo inherit most of these features. So for instance, um, we have dynamic dependency resolution, um, which uses um, course here in, in, in the background. So we can import any, any um, JVM library, any Maven dependency basically, and just run that in, in, our, in our notebook. So here we have the, the Squance library, and we just import that and use it for in our calculations. Uh, so this is really nice. Uh, we also get the uh, syntax highlighting and pretty printing. And um, something that was recently added is um, uh, also added to Ammonite um, is auto-completion for, um, for, for main um, dependencies. So this is really nice if you don't know the, the latest version of a library. You can just um, hit, um, hit shift and then it will show you what's what's available, um, and of course we also have um, auto completion on 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 regular code. So here uh, it knows that we are mapping over a string, and gives us all the the completions uh, on on string. So there's another feature, type hints and metabrowse integration, uh, which is. A little bit unstable. Um, I'm, I'm going to try it nevertheless. Uh, so if I hit um, shift, shift tab, I hope I don't kill the kernel multiple times. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Um, this will give us a nice uh, type hints here. So some some IDE-like features. And um, so what can you see from this? from this type hint from the map function. Anyone? Exactly, so this is uh, still not 2.13, but it's coming. Um, I think we're waiting for cats or something like that. Um, so and we, when we click on that, um, this actually fires up a Metabrowse server, um, which lets us um, look at the source code of this. So this is really cool to, yeah, to to see, uh, to see the the code of, of of something. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, let me close that. We can also use the the Ammonite, Ammonite API, in, um, so not everything uh, makes sense. But for instance, we could take the um, the history. So here we basically see the three uh, uh, latest cells we've sent, uh, we, we, we've run, um, which is sometimes sometimes handy. Uh, or we could look at, at the repositories, of course, at, at new new Maven repositories here. And um, Almond also gives us an API to talk to the to the front end to the browser. And this is what powers 
um, these rich outputs we've seen um, in, in, in the data exploration examples. So if you import the, the element display, uh, the method, methods on, um, in element display, I think they're actually automatically imported. Um, we get all these, these uh, methods uh, for output, so we can um, send some HTML or an SVG or um, load an image and then send that to the browser. Um, LaTeX equations and even JavaScript. Um, but this is somewhat restricted in newer front ends like JupyterLab because of um, security concerns. And basically, we can, uh, if the front end supports something, we can, uh, we can basically send any MIME type. And if the front end knows how to display it, uh, we, get, we get these rich outputs. So we could also have plugins for, for other things. Uh, and based on, on this, we have um, some uh, higher level widgets like um, a progress bar. And if we keep this handle here, um, we can also update the progress bar in, in, later, um, in later cells. So let's try this. So this gives us a, a way to yeah, to, to basically show, show some progress on loading data or things like that. We can also read user input. Um, so this will just then be um, written into, into this well. And um, oh yeah, we also have a, um, a nice feature um, for seeing what's going on when there's some ca calculation in the background. So if we ha have this feature here, um, let it, let's just run this. Uh, we can see um, this animation while it's running. And as soon as it's finished, it should actually update and we get the, the final value. Um, and the same, we have the same for, for vars. So if we update that x here, we get this, this, the updated value in, 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 the, in the output. And we can use uh, these APIs in, in our own libraries, which we can then provide to notebook users. So we, we could depend on the, on the Scala kernel API. And then in, in our library, um, um, use it. So we, we, let's, just, let's just simulate that here in, in the cell. So we'd have um, this implicit instance of Jupyter API available um, to use. And we, we can use that to send output to the front end. Uh, um, so let's just run that here. And then in our library, we, we can, uh, sorry, in our notebook, we can just Im, uh, import this, this library and, and use it. So hmm, I think that we can do better, right? Oh, not better. OK. OK, I like this one. <laughs> um, so far, we've mostly look, looked at this um, from a learner's perspective. But um, what about teaching? Um, so one thing I hope has become clear is that um, notebooks are a nice way for actually demonstrating live code in slides. Um, but what about? library documentation. So of course, you could just create notebooks uh, from scratch. Um, but usually, you already have some documentation available. And uh, most of the time, this is um, marked down with code fences for the examples. Um, and if you think about notebooks are, are quite similar. We also have um, these markdown cells and then um, code cells. Um, just that they, that we can actually run them, uh, and they are encoded differently. So notebooks are basically a, a JSON document. Um, um, fortunately, we have uh, tools like Notedown that let us convert um, this Markdown with code fences to notebooks, and also converts the 
the code fences to actual code cells. And um, I'm currently working on something that works a little bit, a little bit better with, uh, with TUT or MDoc um, and all these modifiers, um, but it's not finished yet. Um, and then if you have that, these notebooks with your documentation, um, of course you want to, to share them, let someone uh, actually use them um, without, without uh, too, much, too much effort, right? And this is where Binder comes into play, which is a really cool service. Um, so basically, what we can just give it a, a, a Git repo. And uh, what it does is it creates a Docker container with a notebook server and our, um, our notebooks in that repo and gives us back a link. And um, we can... And, and when we click on that link, we, we get a, a running notebook server with our notebooks. So this runs somewhere in the cloud, but, the, but it's a free service. And I think we got a little bit of time. So let's just try this. So here we have the binder website. And um, we're using the, the Almond examples repo. And um, just launching this thing. And the first time you add a, a repo or if you update something, this, this will build the, the, Docker, uh, the Docker image. But now it's already built, so it should be a little bit faster if the internet works. Yeah, it looks good. So here, here we have uh, a running notebook server with, with JupyterLab and, and the, the element examples. And we can just try them out so we can, uh, for instance, look at the Scala Meta tree guide and just run things. And I think it takes a little bit longer here because the, the, the resources are limited and it has to, to uh, compile Ammonite stuff first. But after some time, it should actually run. Let's give it a few more seconds. Oh yeah, it also has to download things, of course, because um, it's not cached. So here you see Cursi in action. Did it run? Uh, okay. The internet is, oh no, now it ran. So um, now we can use it here and um, just try things. And there's also um, other examples like um, Spark. Um, so here we can see the, the Spark integration of, um, of Almond in action. So I encourage you to, to give it a try. You can just, there's a link in the, in the Almond docs and in the example repo to, to run this. So if you're interested, um, there's the Jupyter website um, for information about Jupyter in general and how to run these things. And Almond also has a shiny website with documentation for, for installation and, um, and usage. Um, so check it out. And then uh, we've just seen the examples repo. So there you can just try, try these things out without, without any local setup and, and get a feeling um, how this works. And we'd also love to see contributors. So um, we want to have more library and framework integrations um, and, of course, more examples. Um, then there's the story of better IDE integration. And we also need a logo. So if, you're, if you have better design skills than me, um, yeah, if you're interested, just talk to, to, to Alexandre. Um, or me, or join our GitHub channel, um, or check out the, the Almond repo. So to recap, we, we've seen that, um, that REPLs and worksheets are 
really great tools for for exploration and rapid prototyping, but they don't really cover these these other learning phases. And um, with Jupyter Notebooks, or with Notebooks, we get this this integrated view. So we have they integrate uh, documentation, uh, runnable code, and also rich output in a single document, in a single in a single view. Um, and that makes them a very powerful tool for, for teaching and for interactive learning, um, but of course also for data science and data exploration. Um, and Almond, yeah, by combining the, the power of Jupyter and Ammonite, um, brings that experience to Scala. So thank you very much. And I still, we, I think we've still got some time for, for a few questions. Thank you. Oh, um, hi. Sorry. Uh, Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So I've uh, just got a question about um, using Almond uh, in a teaching environment because I think the problem right now that I'm, because uh, I've helped uh, organize some scholar workshops and the number one problem is always uh, getting the participant to set up the environment correctly. So I think um, Almond is actually uh, going to be a quite a good solution for that. But what I'm thinking of is there any sort of like um, solution in actually um, for the participants to have uh, separate sessions in, uh, say, a notebook, or uh, I, I, you know, just using one server and everyone can connect to that one server and having their own sort of like session. Uh, yes, there's actually a solution. I, I didn't have that on the slides, but it's called Jupyter Hub, which is basically a multi-user notebook server um, and has all kinds of integrations. Um, so you can. But what, what it basically does is it, it runs its own uh, notebook server for uh, for every user, so they are isolated, and you also have uh, authentication, um, pluggable authentic authentication, and you can run that in in in, in the cloud and Kubernetes and, and things like that. That so this is this might be a so solution. Uh, so, sorry, so um, this is something that can easily, easily be done, so you just plug Elman into this Jupyter Hub. Uh, oh, yeah, so this is, this is basically separate because, um, um, yeah, it runs a, a Jupyter server, and of course in that, in that server you'd have to, you'd have to pre, pre, uh, provide um, Almond up front, so you'd have to, to install it there, perhaps provide a Docker image or so, depending on your setup. With, with Almond installed already, yeah. Okay, awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah. So, um, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, I have several questions, so first of all, if, could you just list the plugin that you use in the presentation, because it's kind of interesting. So oh yeah, um, so the plugin is called uh, Rise. Um, let me just go back. Um, did I have that? I don't know when the, where, where the slide was, but it's called Rise. Uh, I think if you if you just um, if you just Google it, okay, you'll find I can it. look it up. So Rise is the name. And, and, and quick question regarding Sorry. Spark: Is there in Almond uh, some way of doing paging? Because usually the problem with, with with notebook that you just take data out of Spark, you get a lot of data, and then you're kind of um, your, your server gonna die in some point. So you mean if you're for instance, uh, display a table, a, a data frame, or something like that, and and then you want a page instead of having all all the data. Or, yeah, um, 
yeah, there's no no built-in support. So this, but this is something you you'd cre you, you could create a helper function that actually uh, allows you to 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 page through things. But it it depends a little bit on how on the user experience, right? So if you want something where you can actually page, uh, do the paging through a button in, uh, like have, having a, an, an interactive table where you can page through things, then you'd need to, to build a, a widget that allows that. So this is a little bit more involved. Yeah, than, and that was and, kind of the question, if there is widget for that. Yeah, so this is not, not available now. Okay. Yeah. And is there a way to load your own libraries? I mean, I've, I've seen that you use Ammonite to load kind of Maven, but then it means that you kind of need to, you couldn't work with libraries on your own local machine, right? Yeah, so if you publish it locally, it should, I think it should pick them, yeah, it should pick them up. So if you if you just publish this, uh, if you do an SPT, for instance, to publish local, publish that into a local IV repo, it, it will just work. Okay. More questions, but I'll just grab you after, I guess. One more question. Um, first, super quick question. Vegas 212, when? <laughs> okay. I actually, <laughs> okay. that's a very good question. I actually uh, uh, talked to, uh, to Ace, the maintainer of this, um, yesterday at the uh, community dinner, and he promised to do it soon, but... Okay, tomorrow, I, nice. I, Yeah, Everyone? I tried. <laughs> um, Scala native Python, so I'm so Scala native, and then shell out, not shell out, but like, you know, call Python, so we can basically use uh, all of Python stuff and then destroy it. Um, yeah, so there's... No, no native support for that at the moment, but there's this um, library from, what's it called? Pi I, I, I forgot the name, but there's this library independent of, of, of notebooks where you can actually call, uh, call Python from Scala, so that might be an option. One. Okay, so time is up. Thanks Thank everyone. You.